Well, I got to start off by apologizing because this is not going to be short. It's not a homily. Now, some of you were hoping maybe it would be a nice short homily, but um, there's a sense of the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, and I have to share some things that the Lord has put in my heart. And when Patriarch asked me just a few weeks ago, I guess it was, could you come and share what the Lord's doing right now in the church and in you? Um, on Tuesday, the first day, and I said, sure, I would love to, but the problem is the Lord's been doing a lot in the last few weeks. <laughs> and um, it wouldn't be good if I just told some of the story of what the Lord is doing. So I'm going to do my best to get through it, and I'm going to do my best to share with you what I believe God's doing right now. A um, couple words I have right now, first of all, is the Lord says... Um, don't forget where you came from. And don't forget what I called you to. Second word is lay down your swords. The Lord gave me a word for this year. I started the beginning of the new year and I ask every year for a word of the Lord. Like, Lord, what do you want to say to your church? And for some of you who don't know who I am, I'm Father Brett Crompton. I'm the rector, senior pastor at the Cathedral of the Intercessor. This April will be five years since I've taken over that responsibility this Easter. The Lord gave me a word for the new year, and he was going to break in, break through, and break out. That was the word I had. That it would be a year of breakthrough. So in preparation, uh, I decided to change the series as we were um, coming towards Lent. I preach in sermon series. I think it's important. I get the whole church on one message. We have community groups. They reflect on that message with questions pertaining to that message. So there's a theme, there's a series that happens, and I'm planned in advance, put a lot of effort into that to create and communicate one message. And looking ahead, I had an outline, but the Lord started to stir in my heart because I started reading Joel. And in that preparation of reading Joel, I changed my mind. Isn't that fun? When you have a plan, God changes your mind. The Holy Spirit does. So I'm reading Joel and began words began to leap off the page into my heart and the series was going to become 40 days of breakthrough that that's what we were going to move in because lord gave us this word so i took that word i had that was stirring in me and i brought it to the rector's council and i began to share what i believe god was saying and in prayer and and, and coming together there was consensus that no this is a word and we got to move the church because it was a bigger word for the church and how we're going to mobilize the church and something god was calling us to do Now, here's the crazy thing. We've been through how many Lents in our years? And I had clergy telling me they've never been this excited about Lent in all their ministry. And when I read from Joel, I quickly realized that the people of Israel were in a really bad way. They were really stuck. And Joel says to the people of God, you're looking for man to solve your problem, but there's a bigger problem. It's one that God can only remedy. So Joel, the prophet, gives a word. And how does he begin the word? He blows the trumpet. He sounds the alarm on the holy mountain. And he says, we've got to return to the Lord. He said, be reconciled to God. That's how he began his message. So he calls for a time of repentance. He tells them what to do, that they're to have a holy fast, a sacred assembly, cry out to God, and then he says, maybe, it wasn't guaranteed. He said, maybe he'll have compassion. But he reminded them his love is abounding. Physical obedience brings spiritual breakthrough. That was the message. Joel's calling the people of God back to a genuine faith. He says, rend your hearts, not your garments, and return, return to the Lord. He said, this is the thing that we have to do. And in other words, we've had the, the outward expression of worship and praise, but inwardly God was far from us. That you praise me with your lips, but your hearts are far from me, just as Jesus quotes Isaiah. There's a famine, a drought in the land. There's no hope. There's no way out. There's a hunger and thirst, but it's for the things of the world to meet their physical need. The locusts have consumed their crops. The rivers are dried up. It's hopeless. 
And we could see that for ourselves in our own pandemic, in our own crisis. The world's become upside down um, socially, economically, morally, spiritually. Supply chains are affected. There's division, separation. Everyone's looking for answers. But I think some of the problem was that the church had become consumer focused, not discipleship driven. People left the faith. They deconstructed the faith. They isolated and the people of God look for the world to solve their problems as well. The crops and the rivers are dried up. We must turn back to God. See, I believe it's a word that was not just given to me for intercessor. I believe it's a word for the church. And how do you communicate something like that? You know, I feel like I have this revelation of God speaking something deeply. And I just begin to share anyone who will listen to me so that word can come out. The parallel of Joel's message and the current state of the church is all too real. There's a need of repentance. There's a need to return to the Lord with all our heart. Amen. So two weeks before Ash Wednesday, I started to get notifications. That was Super Bowl Sunday about this thing happening at Asbury, Asbury University. And I'm reading and it says the students haven't left the chapel from praying. They were there 48 hours, 96 hours, 168 hours in prayer and worship. And it really got my attention. And one of the reasons it got my attention, for some reason, I was reading about revivals just a few weeks earlier, particularly in 1970, what happened in Asbury. And I was just reading all about it just two weeks prior to this. And we're seeing these students are crying out to God that there was this genuine, authentic need for God. And I was watching it. I put on the live stream and in my spirit, I was moved as I watched. And there were times I just would begin to weep. So I get this prompting to go to Asbury. And the Lord says, I want you to bring your kids. I have two kids, Gen Z. And um, it's a week before Ash Wednesday. I had stuff all over my calendar. It's like, no way. And the Lord's telling me to, to bring them. Not so much for me, but there's something God was doing in another generation. And I wanted to have them be part of it. And I was curious in my own right. So the Sunday before Ash Wednesday, I still haven't made up my mind. The stirring continues. And the only window left now, it's Sunday before Ash Wednesday. And it's 1,500 miles round trip. And I'd have to do that in less than 72 hours. So on Sunday, February 19th, after our church services, I knew I had to go. And I knew I had prepared my kids. Hey, we might be going for a little field trip. And I said, be ready. <laughs> but of course, spiritual warfare begins in that moment. And now you got to stand, get out of church. It's two o'clock and this is a long drive. And I get home and I begin to have incredible stomach pains. I don't normally get that. I mean, like bent over stomach pains. And we got to go if we're going. And, and this is the only way we can get there. There's, there's no way we can fly. There's no way, like, we have to go. And, and, and the warfare begins. And I recognize that. And then I turned to my son, and both my kids are spirit-filled, following the Lord. And uh, I said, we're going to go. And he's like, Dad, this is crazy. You want to get in a van and drive in 72 hours, 1,500 miles. And there was resistance. And I'm starting to get frustrated. I don't feel well. I want to go in the car. I think you're supposed to go to this. And I had one of those God moments with my son. And I said, listen, I won't be mad if you don't go. You can go or not go. I said, Lord, the only thing I'd ask is you pray right now and ask the Lord, what do you want me to do? And whatever the Lord tells you, you do. But you got 10 minutes because I'm leaving. <laughs> <laughs> so a few minutes later, my daughter texts him and she said, I don't know what you said to Aiden, Dad, but he's packing his bag and he's ready to go. So we left. No plans, no hotel, no clue, nothing to expect. I found an address to the university, never been to Wilmer, Kentucky before. And on the way we're going there, we're getting reports, multiple reports, that the town of Wilmer is closed, that um, the, the college is not letting anyone else in, that there's no hotels, that there's all this negativity I'm like three, 400 miles in at this point. It's 750 miles one way. And I'm thinking, I'm not turning around. This is crazy. The Lord said, go, I'm going to go. And so I reach out to my wife who does a little research to tell me, no, you know, it's they, they close certain roads and towns. And um, so we go and 
uh, we continue to head by faith. There's more to the story that I can share at another point of all the ways that God met us by faith, but we get there and had, were able to get a hotel by faith. Someone took care of that. And um, I know we got to get up the next morning. It's Monday. It's President's Day. We got to go. So um, with less than four hours sleep, we get up and um, I, I get them up. Let's go. We got to go. And we head over to the university and uh, follow the ways you know, directions, we get there, and you come to the beginning of the university, and the line is around the whole university. I mean, there's just thousands of people everywhere. And I get up to the sign, it says Asbury University. I don't know right, left, I don't know where we're parking. So I just make a right. Now they're towing cars, all these things that you're hearing. I make a right, I go around the university, I look over to my right, I see a parking spot, and I parked. I said, I guess that's okay. Mm -hmm. Get out and we start walking. I walk into the center of the university. I'm heading towards the quad and um, thousands of people everywhere. And there's another line. So we get on that line. Older gentleman taps me on the shoulder. He goes, is this the 25 and under line? I said, I have no idea. So I tapped the young person in front of me. I said, they were all young people. So I said, is this it? They said, yeah. But if you were bringing a group or people, they were letting a chaperone or someone older because the focus there was on Gen Z, the focus was to get those who were 25 and under present and let them lead as well in that process. So the only way I can describe the quad and the atmosphere and everything that was going on, it was electric. It was unity. It was worship. There was prayer. The, the people didn't need to be in the chapel to worship God. And, and, and you can sense that. You can sense an anticipation and an excitement and the expectation that was there. And Spirit of the Lord was all over that place, and you just stepped into it. So, sensing the atmosphere is different, anticipating going in. We stayed online, I don't know how long it was, a few hours. And um, we get going, and they open the doors, and we walk in to what they call his used chapel. Now, what you need to know is that they had to start controlling by the crowds coming in, but they still have not stopped worshiping and prayer 24 hours seven days a week that that was going on so you walked into worship you walked in to something that was already happening it wasn't something they were going to begin or start and immediately you're struck by the presence of god immediately and my experience was when i got there to get to my seat that i'm standing in the holiness of god immediately not been in the holiness of god I, I know what that's like, but not like this. I was in the holiness of God, and in that same second that I'm in the holiness of God, I'm struck by that I'm not worthy to be in his holy presence. I know who I am. I know I'm not worthy. And then again, in that same second, in that same moment, the love of God was being poured out, his grace, his forgiveness, his mercy, his healing, his restoration. It all happened at once. It was all in one moment this took place. So all I could do was weep and worship. So I finally looked at my watch after being there a while. Two hours have gone by and it felt like 10 minutes. Next time I looked at my watch, three hours went by and it felt like 10 minutes, another 10 minutes. It was as if time stood still in those hours. There was these confirmations that were taking place because they would have kids, students read scripture. So they'd pick something, you got a scripture, come bring it forward. And um, first kid gets up to read what the Lord gave him. And he comes out of Joel 2. Professor gets up, who's just conducting, and he says, um, all you have to do is allow God to break into your life. Break in, break through, break out. What I saw was a generation that was hungry and thirsty for God. And the Beatitude says, if we hunger and thirst, we'll be filled. Beatitude also says, blessed are the pure in heart. What will they do? They shall see God. 1,600 plus students crying out to God in repentance, prayer, and worship. This is the same thing I saw in Joel, that the Lord had a breakthrough. Coming home, all I could do is ask the Lord, what now? It's kind of like one of those moments you can stand all of Monday over 10 hours of worship and prayer and being in the presence of God is like a little season. And 
exhausted, which I'm glad because when we're weak, he's made strong. You know, I'm out of the way. The flesh is just beaten up. And we're driving home and I'm asking the Lord, what do you want me to do? I don't even know what to do with this. I asked my kids, they couldn't even speak. They just kind of like sat there. And Lord said, be ready. He said, I want you to shepherd what I'm about to do. We got in really late Tuesday night. Wednesday's Ash Wednesday. Come to Ash Wednesday and um, there's this anticipation. God, what are you going to do? We have three Ash Wednesday services. I do the noon, the evening. I couldn't even get open. I couldn't get through the collect. Every word I was reading was just rending my heart. And it was, an, again, a moment where the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And that continued. And, and then back in the evening, we came back again. And um, the Lord spoke to me clearly at that time. Now, I had planned a series. We were going to declare a holy fast. We were going to have a sacred assembly. We were going to cry out to God. And I figured out a way to do that. On Wednesdays, we'll come together, community groups. I kind of had my format for it. And the Lord says, I want you to open the church for 24 hours a day. And I want you to gather every night at seven o'clock for a sacred assembly. You got a new plan. <laughs> I'm like, all right, I'm in. I don't know if they will be, but I'm in. So I proclaimed that in the evening end of Ash Wednesday, when I told everyone what we're doing, since we're really not ending, you can go home, but we're going to stay. Those who would choose to stay, we're going to pray and we're going to worship and we're going to cry out to God. No one left. We were there at almost midnight, 11 o'clock midnight. The Lord broke into intercessor on Ash Wednesday. And he's breaking through the lives of people ever since that evening. What I realized for me, what kind of came to mind was the river banks are useless without a river. You know, the purpose of a river is to produce power, to lead everything in one direction, which brings unity. It turns over and exposes what's on the bottom. It smooths rough stones. It shapes the land. It gets you through a valley. It's a living water. So you'll never thirst again. A river presents God's life-giving presence, the greater work of his Holy Spirit in our life. Just as we just read in the Samaritan woman at the well where Jesus says in John 4, 13 through 14, he answers her, he says, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. See, it'll take a move of the Holy Spirit to help people turn their hearts back to God. Maybe we've been trying to bend the Lord to our will instead of doing his. The Lord didn't ask us to build our church. He said, build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. We must rend our hearts, return to the Lord with a whole heart. The Lord said, stop leading with your head and just lead from your heart. The Lord promises he'll restore the people. He says, first the former rain and then the latter rain. Then he says, I'll send an abundant of showers. In Joel 2.24, it says, The threshing floor shall be full of wheat, and the vats overflow with new wine and new oil. And that wheat represents love, charity, harvest. It represents a new life. New wine and oil represents the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm not a um, news person. I quit watching the news years ago because it's just chaos. I don't need that insanity in my life. So I decided that I would just upload good resources and find out what's going in the world every evening and do a quick preview of what, what's happening. And in the fall of 2022, just reading through, I'm not a like crazy weather person either. I don't like follow the weather trends, and but I'm reading about California and I'm watching how they're talking about this devastation of a drought, which was three plus years, I believe. <coughs> And things are, are, are dire in the midst of this drought. And I'm thinking, wow, 
I know it goes in patterns, but California is becoming in a bad way. Lake Mead and Colorado River and all these things, I mean, it's drying up. They have no water. I'm thinking that's not good, right? They're going to have to come up with some kind of solution at some point. And quickly, in the beginning of the new year, as I read the news, I start reading about these atmospheric rivers that if you're only from the West Coast, you understand what that is. I've never even heard of that before. And then if you've been reading, you find that all of a sudden they're coming one after the other. I mean, they just had a Pineapple Express that comes from Hawaii. They've got more on the way. There's record-breaking snow. There's record-breaking water. The water's coming down so much they're opening levees that, that it's just pouring out upon that state. And I don't know why the atmospheric river just stuck out with me, but then I was reading through Joel, and Joel talks about the former rain. And the former rain, they come in the winter. The latter rain comes in the spring. And while I was reading this, I was thinking about what took place. And, and Joel says this, I'll restore to you the years the swarming locusts have eaten. I'll restore that. The years. I'll restore it. And if you know anything about the rain or what takes place is that former rain comes in the winter like an atmospheric river. And that former rain comes and it comes violently. And, and what it's supposed to do is it's supposed to hit the soil so it turns everything up. So it exposes everything that all of a sudden now everything's getting turned up and the whole reason that that's getting turned up and turned over and exposing all those things is so when the latter rain comes, there'll be a spring harvest. So now the harvest can come through. And God was breaking through in this atmospheric river to prepare us for a latter rain that would come, which I believe is this spring. He says, I'll restore those things. See, only the Lord can restore lost time. The years that were lost, he can restore them in an instant. And then in that instant, that's when subtleties begin, when things begin to happen. Now, if you go to Joel 2.28, which we're familiar with, he says, afterward, afterward, I'll pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. And even on my servants, both men and women, I'll pour out my spirit on those days. And of course, we read that in Acts chapter 2, verse 17, where we know that Peter is quoting Joel for what's taking place in this incredible moment in history. But Christ is glorified, and now he, his promise is being fulfilled. And Joel's called back to that moment. See, Joel is a timeless book. I think it, it mirrors perfectly what's happening right now in the culture. And what was happening then for them was happening again in Acts, and I think it continues to happen for us right now. That that promise of the Holy Spirit that Peter talked about, that Jesus talked about the greater work that was to come, that was to mobilize his church, that was to give his church power. And here's what I believe, the 120 that were in the upper room, when they were there and gathered, I believe that mirrored Joel. I believe they were in repentance, they were fasting, it was a sacred assembly, and they were crying out for God. The Lord right now is making a heavenly invitation for our earthly desperation, and it begins in the church. We have to put our faith back in the fight. We have to forget the former things. In other words, am I willing to abandon my plan for the Lord's greater plan? In other words, am I willing to pray a dangerous prayer that I've been praying for a while now? And my dangerous prayers come, Holy Spirit, and disrupt my plans for your time. Be careful if you pray that, because he will. The renewal, the awakening, the revival, whatever you want to call it, is happening right now in my church. It's a breakthrough. We've had healing, reconciliation, deliverance, salvation, and a hunger and thirst for the Lord. See, the church now is crying out for a genuine faith, which is what Joel is all about. People who are older, who've been there and done that in the charismatic movement, who've done it for decades, are changed. Matter of fact, just the other day, I looked out and it's almost like some of the older people who've been faithful all these decades and know the Holy Spirit. I looked out and I see what God's doing in their life and their countenance is different. Matter of fact, the crazy thing is they look like 10 years younger. All of a sudden, everyone's getting younger. 
That's a good prayer, right, Lord? <clears throat> Newer people who've never experienced anything like that in the last few years have come to Christ and began walking in this new found faith and discovering for the first time there's no preconceived understanding of what God would do when his Holy Spirit moves. And I'm watching the Lord transform their life in front of me. I'm watching how they're expressing what God's doing in their life. Lord says it's time for a transformation. It's time of the transformation. As a church, we've been informed to death and little has changed. But a holy encounter with a living God brings transformation where people's lives will never be the same. We read today in the morning office, see God so good. He had to affirm the things that are in my heart. And if you did the morning office like you're supposed to this morning, I'm just kidding. <laughs> There's a promise of the Holy Spirit that is repeated from the Samaritan woman. What Jesus says again in John 7, 37, 38, he says, On the last day, the great day of the feast, as they're all gathered, Jesus stood up and he cried out. He said, Is any, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Amen. He who believes in me, as the scriptures have said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. See, the river comes out of our heart. And the more that that river of living water is flowing out of us individually, when we come together collectively in unity, it becomes a mighty force. And God uses that to change the topography. God uses that to move in the hearts of those in the church with the ultimate goal to reach those who are outside the church and bring that same transformation. I believe in all my heart right now, God's doing something new, something significant. And it comes through a place of repentance. Paul says, I urge you to the church be reconciled to God. Now, I at least want to leave you with this. I've been in ministry a long time. I know I look really young, but I've been in ministry a long time. I have a good prayer life. I've been faithful to the morning office. I do a pretty good job with my family. I do a pretty good job shepherding the church and loving them the best I can. I feel I work hard as a priest, just as all of you. But I knew God wanted to do something more. And the thing that I encountered when I went to Asbury was I didn't realize how weary I had become. I didn't realize I could be stuck in my own patterns. I didn't realize that God actually had some place deeper he wanted to bring me. Sometimes we've got to come out of that daily routine. We've got to let God interrupt our plans. We've got to let the Holy Spirit work in our lives because it's a deep well. It's a well that never drum, runs dry. So all I'm left with is my goal from this day forward, I, which I'm a pretty good planner and I told the church, the staff, I don't have a strategic bone in my body anymore. Praise God. <laughs> Because part of that is that I want God's plan. Amen. I want to be led by the Holy Spirit. I want to be obedient to the things that God calls me to do. And if I follow that each day, then I'm in the will of the Father. And then his work can be complete through me and in his church. Amen. Amen. Can I just pray for us before we end? Father, um, just as we started, we need you. And... Um, Lord, uh, we need you because our hearts need renewal every day. So, Father, I would pray by the power of your Holy Spirit that you would just consume our hearts. Mm -hmm. Rend our hearts, God. 
Lord, don't rend our hearts so we feel condemnation or shame or guilt. Rend our hearts so we can be made new in your love. Father, would you continue a new beginning right now in this moment in our lives? Would you bring unity to us? Would you bring grace? And would you bring forth power, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.